Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. We have a fascinating show for you this evening. Lieutenant Commander Kevin Dramas of NOAA, the Hurricane Hunters, are here on the show. He's here. It's going to be an absolutely wonderful show, learning from him. Now, before we get started, we usually have a lot of uh, some, some quick background on social flight and things like that. I want to show you some really fascinating things that are going on there. Um, the first thing that I would like to show you here, I'm going to share a, an image. You know, when every time that you start social flight, every time that you launch socialflight.com or the free social flight mobile apps for Apple or Android devices, we feature a user of the day. We feature someone that's uploaded their story, a picture of themselves, of their airplane, et cetera. And yesterday when I launched social flight, I, I just, I got such this heartwarming picture. This is Charlotte Parker of Kingsbury, Texas. She uploaded this picture and her story. She learned to fly at, as she quotes it, the young age of 62. She then flew from Texas to Kentucky to fly her 90 year old mother in this air coupe. It's a 1946 air coupe 415C and uh, she uh, nicknames it Miss Piggy. And so I just wanted to share that story because it, I, I love seeing anything that supports general aviation and being in touch with all of you throughout general aviation. It's just, it's just such a wonderful passion that we all share and get to support in terms of this community. Another thing that I'd also like to share, I usually don't feature uh, in-person events too much because we're spread across such a wide area, in fact, all over the world with our, our viewers and members of Social Flight. That said, um, I do want to talk about a specific event. If you happen to be anywhere in the Northeast of the United States or anywhere close to New England, this coming weekend, I just want to promote there is an event happening. The University of Massachusetts Aeronautics team, uh, they just got back from the AIAA Design Build Fly Challenge, which is an international competition of uh, designing for, en for an engineering program, designing a small aircraft, um, a UAV, and competing in a challenge. And they have a, this great fly-in to celebrate how they did in that competition the first time they ever made it to the competition, and then also um, to have a big pancake breakfast and fundraiser for that organization. That is happening at the Northampton Airport on May 6th, that's Saturday with a rain day on Sunday, and the information, this shows you exactly what you can get inside Social Flight. This is the whole reason that we do it. There's events happening locally to you, all over the country, all over the world, where you can go find things just like this, Go out there, look on the map, see what's happening, and support organizations just like this. And so I just want to put that out there for everyone to see. In addition to that, another thing that I'd like to show uh, there is that tonight's broadcast is brought to us by Massimo and the Massimo Mighty Set. This is a pulse oximeter, uh, and uh, I've been using it. I'll show you this one right here, which is mine. Um, this is an amazing device, and we're really grateful that Massimo supports Social Flight and makes all of this free to you and keeps us going. And um, I'll tell you, I had w used kind of like inexpensive, just off of eBay or Amazon pulse oximeters in the past, and I thought that it was only something that mattered when flying at higher altitudes. What I discovered by using this and the fact that it automatically tracks all your data and downloads it to your phone on an app and you can see everything, it's just, it, it really opened my eyes to how important it was to uh, when flying at night or even at altitudes that weren't as high as I thought. So um, be sure to check this out if you get a chance. It's Massimo uh, Mighty Set. I can tell you there is no comparison to the quality of this device, which is from a medical device company in Massimo and some of the other things that are out there. So be sure to check it out. It's a, it's a great device, has tons of data that you don't normally get in, um, in those uh, you know, other cheap units. So that's enough of that. I just wanted to be able to share a couple um, uh, tips and, and other things about what's going on and make it possible for all of you to get out there, use social flight, find events and get out there and fly. Now, on to tonight's guest, uh, Lieutenant Commander Kevin Doremus of NOAA. 
He is one of the hurricane hunters of NOAA. He's a Boston native local, just like I am up here, a graduate of the Florida Institute of Technology in Melbourne, Florida, and has over 4,100 hours of flight time in NOAA aircraft. And that includes time in the Twin Otter, the Turbo Commander, and the WP-3D Orion. That's the Hurricane Hunter that we, uh, most people associate with flying and doing that mission. He's been flying storm research and reconnaissance flights with the Orion for just over four years. I am absolutely thrilled to have him here tonight to talk to us about NOAA's critical role in understanding weather and saving lives as well as what we can all learn from for our own general aviation flying. I'm gonna bring him on the line now. Please welcome to Social Flight Live, Lieutenant Commander Kevin Doremus. How are you doing, Kevin? Hey, Jeff, good, how? Thanks for having me on, appreciate it. Um, listen, first of all, thank you so much for taking the time to do the show. I know you lead a very busy life. You don't get 4,100 hours in, base, in, in such a short period of time without a lot of travel. Um, I want to start with your background and understanding you see you basically have one of I, I think at least to me one of the dream jobs of aviation although it probably makes your heart race a bit mm -hmm. tell me how you came to work for NOAA and find yourself in the cockpit of the Orion yeah I was really fortunate I uh, had a family member who worked for NOAA in one of our other line offices fisheries and uh, it was an uncle of mine and he uh, him and I were talking, I was like, I think it was my sophomore year of college, and he knew I was going through a flight program. I was like, hey, did you know Noah had airplanes? And I was like, no, I did not know that. So uh, did a little digging. I was always really into the sciences. I always really loved biology and meteorology and all that good stuff, and kind of found this like really cool thing where I could take my love for the sciences and blend them with my love of aviation. It's like, oh, this is perfect. So uh, my junior year of college, I was able to secure an internship with the NOAA Aircraft Operations Center. Uh, which was at the time based in McDill Air Force Base at, uh, mm -hmm. in Tampa, Florida, and did an internship. And I was like, yep, yeah, that's it. Like, I'll do whatever it takes to get this job. And so uh, kind of modified the last few years of my college. Uh, so I guess the last year and a half of my college uh, career, I was taking 22, 23 credits. NOAA has some specific science requirements and credit hours and things like that that I wasn't going to meet. So took a bunch of extra classes, um, try to check all the boxes I could from a leadership perspective. Um, upon graduation of Florida Tech, I still didn't meet NOAA's education requirements, so I ended up uh, working a night shift job at a corporate jet company as kind of a dispatcher uh, while taking graduate classes to meet NOAA's requirements. So uh, about eight to nine months after graduation, I applied for NOAA and got accepted, and uh, the rest is history. Now, were, did you come from an aviation background, or did you always know you wanted to be a pilot, or did you find your way there a little bit uh, through a securitist route? Sure. It was, uh, you know, I always loved aviation. I loved being around airports. Uh, I just never really thought it was something I could turn into a career. And uh, in going to Florida Institute of Technology, I originally went um, as an engineering student and very quickly learned that that was not for me. Uh, I kind of faltered around a little bit my first year or two trying to figure out what I wanted to do and Florida Tech uh, has a really prestigious flight program and I, I saw these group of kids that were having a lot more fun than I was in college. I was like, hey, what are you guys doing? And uh, they're like, oh, we're pilots. So I was like, oh, that sounds awesome. Let's give that a shot. And after one flight, I was like, this is it. Like, this is what I was meant to do. Like, I can't believe it took me this long to find it. And so, uh, that, I mean, that just, I felt like I really felt my calling there in aviation and that the flight program at Florida Tech's fantastic. The instructors are awesome. The ground school is really interesting. Um, and, you know, all the college classes that go along with it. So just being like fully immersed in aviation was, was a really special time uh, in my life. And I really enjoyed it. Uh, and so, you know, normal commercial multi-engine stuff through through college and my winter and my summer breaks, I worked on my CFI, my I, and my MEI. And so ended college with, uh, with a pocket full of uh, uh, ratings, but not a lot of experience. And uh, I was fortunate to find NOAA and uh, they picked me up with uh, not a lot of flight experience and uh, got me to where I am today. Wow, that is, that's, I mean, how cool is it to be, first of all, of course, it, it, it's funny that you fell in with the crowd <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. with, uh, with the smiles on their faces that turns out to be yeah. the aviation guys. And then yeah. uh, to basically find the company that you wanted to work for and make that your mission, make that how you actually uh, directed your college experience and then get hired by them. That's, that's really amazing. Yeah. And it's one of the things that I'm really passionate 
passionate about now is kind of sharing the, or the message of like, we're here, like this is a real job, you can do this. Uh, you know, I really wish that I knew about Noah earlier, um, like high school, I would have kind of tailored my, I think my education path a little bit differently and uh, have kind of a cool experience recently uh, right across the street, I'm here in Lakeland, Florida. There's a high school flying club. This is really, really unique organization. Uh, it's funded by you know, sponsors and the local community. And there's basically high school uh, kids that are flying, building and maintaining vintage aircraft. And uh, I met a student there and uh, we flew around in the cub a little bit. I was doing some instruction for him and we started talking. He's like, hi, oh, your job sounds really cool. And uh, four years later, uh, today, actually, he flew his first flight in a Twin Otter in a blue suit. So, you know, I, part of the reason why I like to do these kind of talks too is hopefully there's somebody on the line that hears about this and says, wow, that's something that's really cool and something I'd like to do someday. And uh, hopefully they can tailor the education a little bit earlier than when I figured it out. Isn't that wonderful that it's not kind of a one in a million thing that someone who, yeah. you know, who sees this now can actually get there, that it's actually possible. Tell me a little bit about the mission of Noah, we, we, I think a lot of us have seen the logo. We certainly hear and understand the concept at, at its best of like the hurricane hunters, but Noah's obviously big. That's a, it's a big organization. So tell me mm -hmm. about a little bit about Noah's mission and how that ties into aviation. Yeah, we are a very, very small sliver of Noah uh, here at the Aircraft Operations Center. Um, Noah has a, a wide variety of missions that protects the airs, uh, the, the ocean and the atmosphere. And uh, a lot of people don't realize it, but NOAA falls under the Department of Commerce. And, you know, back in the day, our P3s, if you look at some old pictures, you'll see big letters on the side that says U.S. Department of Commerce. And everybody would kind of look at it and be like, what's the Commerce Department doing flying into hurricanes? Uh, we were sick of that question, so when we get the new paint job, we just kind of took that off. Uh, but we still work for the Department of Commerce, and the, the thought there is so much of the United States commerce flows through the air, the ocean. And so we're here to basically protect, study, and research uh, those resources. So uh, we are just one of the many line offices of NOAA. So we're the Office of Marine and Aviation Operations. There's the National Weather Service, which when you hear NOAA, most people think about. We have a satellite division uh, called NESDIS. We have the National o Ocean Service. Uh, the National Marine Fisheries Service is a part of NOAA, so they manage a lot of the NOAA fisheries. And so kind of our role here at the Aircraft Operations Center is we are the operational specialist for NOAA and supporting NOAA's projects, research, um, observations, that kind of thing. And part of OMAO, the Office of Marine and Aviation Operations, is we have a large fleet of research vessels, NOAA boats, that go all over the world doing all sorts of interesting things like hydrographic underwater mapping, air chemistry studying, uh, fisheries is a big part of it, maintaining the NOAA buoy system. Uh, it's a it's a pretty cool thing, and that's all supported by NOAA OMAO. And then even a little bit below that is what's the NOAA Commissioned Officer Corps. So uh, much like the military, I wear a rank on my shoulder there. Um, I have a, you know, my rank is Lieutenant Commander, um, just like uh, we fall, fall under like the Navy and the Coast Guard rank system. Um, I used to say we're the seventh smallest, but I have to say the eighth now because of the Space Force. Uh, but we are the eighth smallest service. So, you know, Coast Guard, Air Force, Marines, Navy, Army, um, what am I missing? Space Force. Uh, oh, man, I'm so, yeah. Coast Guard, Navy, Army, Air Force, Marines. Okay, yeah. Uh, the Space Force. And then there's a U.S. Public Health Service, which not a lot of people realize. The Surgeon General, it's like a general. So they do a lot of, they support a lot of, uniform services and their medical needs. We have a, a, a public health service employee that works for us. It's like our flight doc. And then you have the NOAA Corps. So right now we're 321 officers strong. We're very, very small. Uh, on paper, we look like any other military service. We get the same pay, we get the same benefits, get the GI Bill, the VA loan, the pension, all that good stuff. Uh, but instead of being an armed service, we're a uniform service. So uh, we are there to be the, the operational specialist for NOAA, and we drive their boats and we fly their planes. So tell me about the aviation side of it, uh, where you're based. What uh, your aircraft? You're based down at Lakeland, you mentioned, and but the aircraft can be all over the country. Is that correct? Absolutely. So we have a total of nine aircraft. All of them are based here in Lakeland, Florida. We've got four Twin Otters, two King Air 350s a G4 and two P3 Orions. 
We also have some small unmanned uh, aerial vehicles as well, but we don't really count this. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, so our aircraft kind of support missions all over the world. Um, the Twin Otter cruises at about 140 knots, so we're not flying in and out of Lakeland very often. Uh, our planes, we, we kind of call it like a floating fleet. So our aircraft are kind of spread out all over the country. Uh, right now we have a King Air. Uh, I think today they're on their way to Juneau, Alaska to go do some coastal mapping. We have a Twin Otter up in Cape Cod, Massachusetts doing a marine mammal assessment. Uh, we've got another King Air that's doing some mapping along the coastline. Uh, one of our G4, or sorry, one of our P3s is in Waco, Texas, getting a lot of maintenance done, some big like long-term maintenance stuff. Uh, Gulfstream's home right now, but basically our aircraft are just spread all over the country supporting a number of different uh, scientific missions for NOAA. So it's a pretty diverse mission set, brings us to some pretty cool places. Um, our smaller aircraft generally stay uh, CONUS, they don't you know, usually stay in the United States, but the G4 and the P3, uh, we find ourselves in all sorts of weird corners of the world. Hmm. So it sounds like, uh, you know, when we think about flying and, and weather flying, it sounds like quite a few of your missions are actually preservation based or de are dealing with things that have to do with the e ecology the, that supports commerce and, and different areas versus just being weather focused in what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. We have, uh, we have a number of projects that are really important to the American people and a lot of people don't even realize we're doing it. Um, very selfishly, one of the best ones that we fly is called Snow Survey. It's 500 feet, hand flying, uh, in the mountains, doing terrain contouring. Uh, you know, really, it's a cool like pilot program, but it's a really, really valuable program for the um, basically the American taxpayers, um, specifically in areas where there's snow. Uh, when the snow falls in the winter, we can go out and we can map the water content of that snow. So how much water is in that snow? So when that snow melts, where is all that water going to go? And so kind of our biggest uh, push, we're kind of at the end of the big spring melt season up in the, the Midwest and then the Northeast. Um, but the hydrology, the, like the water specialists, like the folks that are basically monitoring the, the rivers, you really count on the data from our aircraft to see like how much water is out there. And are we gonna have to evacuate small towns? Are we gonna fill up our reservoirs to last us through the summer? Is there gonna be a drought? Is there gonna be floods? Like it's really, really important information. And you and get to again, go fly map of the earth flying when you're doing, yeah. and, and is that usually the Twin Otter that you're flying for that? So the Twin Otter and the King Air as well. And the Turbo Commander used to support that mission almost exclusively until we retired it. And you're um, flying 500 feet off the deck with the equipment that's measuring the snow moisture content and generating all of that information that then feeds into the news reports we have about what's expected and and we know how much snowpack there actually is and, and how that's yeah. going to impact what's happening with reservoirs, especially out west, for example. Absolutely, yeah, our, our King Air was just out flying the Sierra Nevadas uh, just a few weeks ago, because uh, as you saw in the news, there was a lot of snow out there and everybody's kind of worried, like, where's it gonna go? Uh, other people are really, really happy because it's gonna fill up these reservoirs that have been empty for a long time. And uh, one of the really neat things about that mission, and I think what's one of the things that makes us really unique here at NOAA, is uh, most of our missions we fly with a scientist or some sort of sensor operator in the back. So survey is pretty unique in that the pilot sitting in the right seat, so it's a two crewed aircraft, is not only being a right seat co-pilot and doing radios and all that stuff, we are also running and managing the science equipment in the back. And at the end of the flight, we're, we're quality checking the data, we're processing the data, and we're sending it off in real time. So it's one of the reasons why we don't just hire pilots, we hire pilots with scientific backgrounds and scientific education because we want our people to not just be good flyers, we want them to be good flyers and also understand the scientific process and what's going on in the back of the aircraft because mm -hmm. the way that we fly the aircraft impacts the outlook and all that really important information that people count on. That makes sense that without knowing you know, what the impact is on whether you're looking straight down with different types of uh, radar or other types of sensors uh, versus banking, without understanding the science, you wouldn't necessarily yeah. know how to, how to properly fly the aircraft. I have a couple of pictures here um, that um, might help. Uh, maybe you can, if you can kind of explain where you are. <laughs> yeah, so I'm pretty sure, I don't remember exactly when this one, this was right after one of the big storms. This is in the flight station of the P3. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you can see it's a pretty manual uh, looking airplane, lots of buttons. You don't have the it's pretty glass panel. There's a lot of buttons. <laughs> um, 
I usually tell everybody like I have no idea what half of them do, but that's not true. I know what every switch does. Um, it's a uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very manual airplane, which is kind of why I love it so much. It's like flying an old warbird, you know. It's uh, it's smelly. It's a little stinky. It's you know you walk down the tube and you can hear like electrical contacts like throwing and hitting, and it's it's pretty cool. It's a pretty unique experience. Uh, you mentioned you showed me earlier the natops uh, for for this. Yeah. Yep, so I've got it next to me here. This is my, let's call this our Bible. Uh, it's seen, it's got a lot of coffee stains on it. Um, it's seen a lot of stuff. We spent a lot of time in that book, uh, basically going front to back. Uh, you know, our initial training for the P3s, uh, about a four to six month long process just to learn to fly the plane. And uh, the amount of things that you just have to know and memorize and, and be aware of, uh, you know, one of the kind of unique things about the P3 is, for every switch in the airplane, we have to know what the power source is. And knowing the power source, you have to know where the circuit breaker is. And mm. uh, it sounds a little funny, but you know, uh, FOUO, fire of unknown origin, is a, I don't wanna say a common occurrence for us, but there's a lot of moving parts in the airplane, a lot of electrical comp components, and those old electrical components will fail sometimes. And so we find ourselves in a fire of unknown origin situation a few times a year, I would say. And really? being a really, yeah, it's, it's relatively common. And a lot of science equipment in the back too. There's a lot of power running through the airplane. So knowing like in that, that exact moment where that circuit breaker is or what bus is going to be affected, it's really important to have that stuff, you know, really nailed down. So we spent a lot of time uh, when we're not flying missions, staying in the books, going to simulator training. Uh, you know, we have a pretty cool culture here where we'll just kind of spot check people and be like, hey, what's the what's the power source for the aux vent valve? And you're like, ah, okay, yeah, I got that one, you know, and, uh, you know, keep each other on our toes and, and it's kind of fun. We, we enjoy it. That's awesome. Well, the, the biggest thing that obviously we, we always think about has to do with hurricane hunting and uh, as the term hurricane hunting, where does this come from? I mean, what's you, you season starts, you stay, you start to see things that I guess satellites or buoys are starting to detect. Tell me about your mission when it comes to hurricanes. Yeah, so we have a pretty diverse mission set, but if you want to really kind of break it down into two, we have two missions when it comes to hurricanes. You have hurricane reconnaissance and you have hurricane research. And so the reason we're called the hurricane hunters is one of the reasons why we're tasked to do what we do is the scientists and the folks that need to issue forecasts don't really know what's out there. They want us to go find it. And so they will task us to say, go find or go hunt for the storm. And so we have a lot of sensors on board. Uh, we fly with a meteorologist. We call them the flight director. Uh, they are looking at the winds and they're trying to look for wind shifts and they're looking for little swirls. And, and we basically hunt for the center of the storm. We want to find the zero wind part of the storm, which is kind of where the hurricane hunting term comes from. Um, so that's typically like our reconnaissance mission is like go out, tell us what the storm is doing, send that info back, send that information back to us. Usually the hurricane center, the National Hurricane Center, Miami, asks for that, and then we land and we go home, and then the next plane goes and does, and we have kind of a constant presence in the storm. Um, so that's do reconnaissance. They have, during that, do they have areas where they already know that there's pressure lows that they want you to explore, or are these aircraft really just kind of hunting from scratch a lot? Yeah, we have a general uh, from satellite imagery from uh, models is one of the big ones that the Hurricane Center really relies on. Uh, they give us a good idea of, you know, what to expect, where to go, where to start your efforts. Um, you know, some of the most challenging storms that we do fly are the really disorganized tropical depressions that are like turning into a tropical storm. There's really no well-defined center. There's all these little, we call them bursts of convection. So basically thunderstorms just scattered around all over the place. And it's just kind of messy. And when you look at it on the radar and you just see a blob of just rain, uh, it's really difficult for, at least for the meteorologists, at least to find the center of the storm. Um, you know, when you start talking about Cat 2, Cat 3, Cat 4, and 5 storms, they're very well defined. They're very easy to see on radar. You can see where the eye is. So you just take the plane and point it right towards the eye and you go. Uh, but sometimes it's the smallest rooms that are A, the most challenging, and B, sometimes uh, make us work the hardest up on the flight station because there's a lot more convection, a lot more kind of rising and sinking air than there is in a hurricane that's a little bit more organized. 
Interesting. Do you find yourself uh, largely starting out uh, the season or starting out looking for things closer to the equator, kind of in that band or that region of instability that we hear about yeah. so much? Um, yeah. yeah, the intertropical convergence zone. Yes. Uh, absolutely. And so we we like those missions because we get to go to Barbados for a few days. So <laughs> <laughs> Typically, what happens is the Hurricane Center. Um, you know, if you if you're from Massachusetts, you're probably not hawking it as much as we are down in Florida. But the Hurricane Center will put out um, kind of a forecast, and it'll be this like big yellow blob on a map, and it will say 10%. And the Hurricane Center says there's a 10% chance this is going to be a storm. And so when we see that at their craft oper operations center, it's like, all right, start packing your bags. Like here comes the tasking because we know they want more information on this thing to issue a better forecast. There's no radar stations in the middle of the ocean. There's no place to launch a weather balloon. They're, they're really the only thing to have is satellite imagery and, and other remote sensing you know, technology. So they really wanna take our flying weather station and put it right into that environment to get that really, really important data. And one of the really unique things that we offer that no other aircraft can do is we have a Doppler radar, a vertical scanning Doppler radar in the tail of the aircraft. We call it our TDR, tail Doppler radar. And so the Hurricane Center specifically for like the smaller storms that are developing for like the intensity forecast, uh, they rely heavily on the T that TDR data um, that's very unique to our aircraft. So, um, you know, so we go down to Barbados, we kind of, we call it like forward deploy. So we send a bunch of people down, sometimes two, three airplanes, so two P3s and the G4, we'll all go down there. Uh, because the storms are too far away to hit from Florida. And so we'll go to Barbados. We usually stay in a pretty nice little beachfront resort there, which we all don't really hate for the end of the day. And uh, we'll do all of our missions kind of out of Barbados. And then as the storm moves its way towards Barbados, we'll hop over to the next set of islands. Typically it's St. Croix uh, in, the, the US Virgin, or in, the, in the Virgin Islands. We can also do uh, Aruba has one of, been one of our forward operating bases. And we kind of just, wait until the storm kicks us out of that location and then we'll just kind of keep falling back until we end up somewhere else, usually back home in Florida, where we can do so, the rest of our flying. So you're in these places, but I assume you're not there during the good weather. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Usually we're there before the bad weather comes and we try to get out before the bad weather gets in, but it's usually pretty dynamic. You know, we, we pack pretty light bags because we got to be pretty nimble. Um, don't really know where we're going to end up. And And this is the Orion behind you? That's it. Yep. That's, uh, and, and that one looks like Miss Piggy, um, which is funny. You mentioned earlier the the um, viewer that sent that picture. Yeah, and she true. said she named her, her plane Miss Piggy. Yeah. Uh, so that's Miss Piggy. We have Kermit and Miss Piggy. So 43 is Miss Piggy. Kermit's 42. Um, and yeah, and you can see on the tail of the aircraft there, that thing that kind of sticks out the back there, that's where the Doppler radar lives. Fascinating. And what's that coming off the front? Uh, so that's a gust probe. Um, so it's a probe that sticks out in front of the aircraft where we can measure undisturbed air, um, mm -hmm. specifically wind speed, vertical wind speed up and down, left and right. Um, and you can see in this particular picture, the, the, nose, ra the nose is lifted up. Uh, looks mm -hmm. like they're doing some work on the nose radar. And it's kind of hard to see, but under the belly of the airplane, there's a big black kind of ball. That is a 360 degree scanning, um, we call it an MMR, multi-mode radar which scans 360 degrees around the aircraft, uh, giving us a really good picture of what the storm's doing. So basically, as we're flying through the storm, we're getting a three-dimensional radar picture of it as we're going through that. And the, the scientists uh, really love the data that comes off the aircraft for that. Wow. Now, the obviously, aircraft don't normally target going into bad weather. You usually normally, normally target going away from it. What is it about the Orion that makes it such an ideal platform uh, to withstand going in there, or, or is it just about the equipment you can load on it? Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit of both. So uh, both of our P3s, Kermit and Miss Biggie, were built in uh, 1975 and 1976. And so everybody asks, like, why are you flying these old planes into these storms? And it's, these planes are so customized and so specially built for this mission that it's so hard to find something that can do the same thing right? It's a very, very unique aircraft. And one of the reasons why we really like the P3 is its ability to handle water ingestion. And so it's it's a P3 thing, but it's mostly a turboprop thing. So it's a four, four engine turboprop. Each engine's making about 4,600 shaft horsepower. So super powerful. Um, if you were to take a, 
like a 767 with the big turbo fan and you fly it through the kind of water and rain that we fly it through, you'll probably flame out both engines pretty quick. Wow. Uh, but with four big fat propellers out there, we just kind of beat the air into submission until it does what we want it to do. And uh, it handles it handles the water ingestion really, really well. And the other thing that we really like about it is in a turbofan engine, um, like a 7.3 or 7.6 or something like that, like as you push the power levers up, you've got about a you know eight to 12 seconds spool up time. Uh, so going from flight idle to max power takes a lot of time. Flying in the hurricane environment, we have to react very, very quickly to changes in airspeed. Um, headwinds, tailwinds, downdrafts, updrafts, we have to quickly um, be able to power out and power uh, into those environments. And so our engines are constant speed engines, so they're always spinning at 100%. And so mm -hmm. when we change the power lever position, we're not necessarily changing the speed of the engine, but we're changing the blade angle of the prop to take a bigger or a smaller bite of air. And because the reason we really like that is we have basically an instantaneous reaction to a power lever change. And mm -hmm. so we're really easily able to kind of maintain our airspeed uh, that way. With the turbofan engine, it would be pretty difficult to do. Right. So you've got responsiveness. Obviously, you've got water ingestion as a factor. Um, what about G-force loading and turbulence? What about that as an issue? Yeah, so this is uh, the P3. So we have WP3D Orions. There, there were two P3 Orions built for us from Lockheed Martin, and the W designator is weather. So there's only two of them in the world. We have them. In general, for the most part, they are identical to a standard Navy P3 Charlie model. Um, the only modification, structurally at least, that we made to the aircraft was actually beefing up the floorboards inside the aircraft because we carry so much more equipment on the airplane. Mm -hmm. um, science equipment, racks, uh, that kind of thing. But the wings are the same, the structure of the aircraft is the same, the engines are the same. We have slightly upgraded engines that we got uh, a few years ago that give us a little bit more power and a little better fuel efficiency. Um, but in general, if you put them side by side to a Navy P3, they're pretty much exactly the same. So it's just that, that, that the design of the basic P3 is just that strong that you're not uh, as concerned about the kind of uh, turbulence or g-forces that might be that might uh, happen to the aircraft in in normal flight. I, I would assume I'm, I don't know if this is true. Is, is it that you have to essentially be like when we think as GA pilots at kind of like your maneuvering speed at uh, if you're dealing with difficult winds at most times? Yeah. So it's it's actually really interesting. So we kind of have a magic. A magic airspeed is 210 knots indicated, and it's essentially our maneuver speed. You go too fast, you overstress the airplane, you go too slow, you can stall the plane, right? So maintaining 210 knots is really, really important to protect the airplane. Now, how we do that, that's where it gets kind of cool and kind of interesting, and I kind of call it like, uh, like we're dancing up in the cockpit a little bit. So we've got three, three people in the flight station. You got a pilot in the left seat, you got a pilot in the right seat, a co-pilot, and then in the middle seat, we still fly with flight engineers. And you know, everybody hears flight engineers, they think like old old time, like DC-8s back in the airlines, whatever. Uh, our flight engineers are absolutely critical to our operation. And uh, they are actually the ones maintaining our airspeed for us manually with the power levers. And so the person in the left seat, so the pilot flying, their job is to keep wings level, fly an assigned track over ground, if you fly a heading and you go into a hurricane, you're just going to get blown downwind. So we're constantly adjusting our um, our angle into the wind to maintain a straight line over ground. Our flight director will assign that track. So let's say fly a track of 090. And so the pilot flying is maintaining altitude, mostly wings level, and maintaining the track. The pilot in the right seat is the primary link between the communications with the back of the aircraft. So they're listening to the science crew, they're working with the flight director. We also have a navigator, um, kind of making sure all the communications happening and then backing up the pilot by calling air speeds and things like that. And then the flight engineer is maneuvering the power levers to maintain 210 knots. So where it gets funky is when you have four engines all producing 4,600 horsepower, so you got the power levers all the way up, the flight engineer will say, uh, like 3,500, let's say that's like the number we typically use, 3,500 shaft horsepower, and let's say the plane's still slowing down. And so the pilot in the right seat will say 200 knots, you're slow. And then what the pilot in the left seat will do is take the nose of the airplane and actually push it over and trade altitude for airspeed to try to get back to 200 knots. 
And the opposite of that will happen when you get a big gust or something like that. Uh, the plane, the airspeed skyrockets for whatever reason, the flight engineer will pull the pilot levers back to flight idle. He will say flight idle. The pilot in the right seat will say, um, you're fast. And then you take the nose of the airplane and you pitch it up. So you're kind of like, you're kind of riding this out. You're not really maintaining altitude. Um, mm -hmm. There are certain situations with the updrafts where you'll be at flight idle and just climbing and climbing and climbing. Your airspeed is just up and you'll go 1,500 to 2,000 feet above your assigned altitude and you just kind of ride it out because you really have to protect the airplane with that airspeed. And that's really the only way to do it in that environment. So it's a delicate ballet of all all three of the folks up there in the cockpit controlling things to maintain that airspeed. It's not just any yeah. one in a way of making that happen. Um, if your target airspeed is right around 200, as you said, and we see these kind of stories of sustained winds in a major hurricane above 200 or something like that, does that cause it to, are you able to keep up at, in the worst case scenarios yeah so pretty much every time we're flying in a big storm we're flying with the wind 90 degrees off one of the wings right so all okay. storms we're, we'll never fly with a headwind basically um, you never so fly directly directly peripherally into uh the 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 oncoming wind exactly yeah so we fly our, our standard pattern we do a bunch of different patterns but our standard pattern is like a we call it a figure four so you start in the outer rain bands of the storm and you draw a straight line to the eye. And so as you're flying that straight line to the eye, let's say you start to the south and you're going north. So in the northern hemisphere, all of hurricanes spin counterclockwise. So you have a wind off the left wing. And as you get closer and closer to the storm, you gotta adjust your heading to maintain that straight track over ground. And mm -hmm. there'll be certain times where you'll have your heading will be 30 to 40 degrees off of your track over ground. So you're flying like sideways. Uh, but all your instruments are saying, you know, you're flying straight. And I think one of, one of the coolest experiences, and the first time I experienced this, I was just like, my mind was just like, Phew. Um, you know, a hurricane is just a big low pressure system, right? So uh, for all the pilots here, you hear high to low, look out below, right? So when you go from high pressure to low pressure, you have to be careful because you're going to fly, you know, you'll be at a lower altitude, right? So we have a, a radar altimeter on the aircraft. Our typical mission altitudes anywhere between eight and twelve thousand feet, um, and the science. Most of our science requirements have us fly a pressure altitude, not a radar altitude. So we want to maintain eight thousand feet pressure altitude. So on the outside of the storm, uh, if an eight thousand foot pressure altitude, let's say the radar altimeter is eighty five hundred feet, in the eye of the storm, since it's a concentrated low pressure, you could be as low as like sixty five hundred feet. Wow. And what's, re what's really weird is your VSI is the same and your altimeter is the same, but you're descending all the way down. And so typically when we're going into a big storm, like a Cat 4, Cat 5 with a really strong pressure gradient, we have a tendency for the airplane to get fast. Even though our altitude says we're level and our VSI says we're not climbing or descending, we're descending into the eye. And a lot of times you'll pop out of the eye wall and you'll actually physically be like looking down at the water. Those really oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. And then you get to the eye and you're going to go out the other side. You end up having to climb out of the storm. Again, same pressure gradient, same altitude the whole time, but you have a tendency to get slow going out of the storm because you got to climb out of it with a little bit extra power. And so it the first right. time I really experienced that, it was like, oh wow, this is, this is unique. <laughs> That's amazing. And is there ever yeah. any issue having enough power to make that happen of coming back out? Uh, no, it's not usually, uh, you know, with the turbo props and four of them, you know, you've got a lot of power to work with and um, we'll, you know, always sacrifice altitude if needed to kind of maintain that airspeed. Um, but we've got a lot of, a lot of excess power on the aircraft to get through that. Wow. Now you mentioned the eye of the hurricane. I, um, uh, we recently had on my good friend, Captain Brian Schiff. He says to anyone, if they, that's the best place to ever go flying is the eye of the, is, is it true? Is that like the, is that it a is, good place? Yeah. I mean, maybe getting there is not the best, but once you're, <laughs> once you're in the eye, it's glorious. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, you know, a lot of times when we have issues with the airplane or emergencies or something going on in the back, uh, we're like, get to the eye. Like that's the safe space. Really? Now, not all eyes are the same. Um, you know, there are, we have been in some very, very powerful storms where you have a 10 mile eye. So, or maybe sometimes even less than that. So you have no room to maneuver. You're in and out like that. Uh, wow. And 
between every pass, the eye can change very dramatically. Um, but you know, some of the some of the best storms, like the big storms, uh, where you're in turbulence, like pretty much the whole flight, which means everybody's sitting down and they have to have their seatbelts on, and you can't get up. And these are eight to ten hour emissions. People have to use the bathroom at a certain point. And so what we'll do is sometimes if we know we're going to be in a lot of turbulence for a long time, we'll budget time in the eye and do some circles and give people a chance to just like get up, stretch your legs, use the bathroom, fill up the coffee cups, that kind of thing. Uh, so if you ever watch this on flight tracking and you see doing a bunch of circles in the eye, somebody probably just had to use it. <laughs> Everybody's going to the bathroom. And obviously yeah. I'm kidding about that before because like the last thing you want to do if you're on the ground and there's this hurricane, all of a sudden things get better is go flying. I assume that uh, uh, that, that, that it's never a good idea <laughs> if you're on the ground 100%. and you're, you happen to have a nice break in the middle of uh, your hurricane to ever do yeah. anything with your plane. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't recommend that. Definitely wouldn't recommend that. No. Nope. But that's fascinating that you use the eye of the hurricane as an escape route, essentially, and a break for all the work Absolutely. that you're doing. Yep. Yep. And, uh, you know, we've had situations with, uh, you know, things going wrong in the back of the airplane. And, like, let's say um, a hydraulic pump decides to catch fire or something like that. Like, <laughs> you're. Your people, they can't get. I know it sounds. It's, it's not that normal. This is an example. Like it's not it's normal. related. <laughs> yeah, I know. We're trained to think like worst case scenario. Uh, but like you know, we've had situations where the things are going wrong in the back of the airplane. Nobody can get out of their seat to handle it. You know, because there's too much turbulence, they get hurt. So we're kind of like everybody, hang tight. We're getting to the eye, or we'll find like a like a band that we can maneuver in or something like that. But typically, like the eye is the best spot for us to do that kind of stuff because the air really, really smooths out for us. Wow. You're blowing my mind with some of this because on one hand, you're dealing with uh, engines and a setup that can ingest massive amounts of water. On the other hand, every emergency example you're giving me is catching fire. <laughs> yeah, there's, like, there's a lot of moving parts on the plane, you know. It happens sometimes. We got backups so, and everything and good crew in the back to help us out. So generally, what are you what are you doing when you're when you're dealing with a hurricane and you're going there? Are you mapping pressures and wind speeds, or uh, I, I, I notice sometimes you drop things out of the aircraft as well? Yeah, hopefully absolutely. things so, you intend on dropping out. Definitely, yes, plan yeah. drops. Um, yeah, we do all sorts of stuff. So it's kind of dependent on the mission, um, but one of the kind of the unique things about the P3 is it's very customizable. And we can do multiple missions in one flight. So we will fly with anywhere between a crew of 15 to 20. And on that flight, we can have five or six different scientists running five or six different experiments or looking for five or six different things at the same time. You know, being able to get into that environment um, from a scientific perspective is super, super valuable and very difficult. And there's only a few times of the year we can do it and a few planes that you can do it on. So uh, we tend to maximize the amount of work that we can get done in one flight. So from a reconnaissance perspective, you know, goal number one is to find the center of the storm. And typically that is like the zero wind part of the storm. So if you're watching your, you know, live map, you can see the wind go from this direction to that direction. It, it basically swoops down and it go from like 50, 40, 30, 20, zero. 20, 40, 50, you know, and it goes up. So if you can find that center part of the storm, we'll do what's called mark center. And we will take uh, a pressure measurement from the aircraft at the center and uh, we'll mark the location and we'll drop what's called a drop sign. Um, so I actually have one here. Keep it as a little prop on my desk. So this is a drop sign. It's basically uh, the best way to describe it is a weather balloon in reverse. So it launches out of the airplane. There's a parachute that kind of pops up, a little drag chute, so it slows things down. And then in the bottom here, there's a little sensor. And uh, there's all sorts of equipment built into here. It's kind of like a cardboard material, so when it hits the water, it disintegrates. Um, it sends back temperature, pressure, humidity, dew point, and then most importantly, GPS drive, wind speed. And so the scientist and everybody on the ground wants to know what's going on at the surface, uh, but we're not going to take the P3 and fly it down on the surface in a hurricane. So the drop sign gives us information through all the different layers of the atmosphere, all the way down to the water. That information comes up to the aircraft in real time. We kind of QC it, uh, quality check it in real time, hit a button and send it off to the hurricane center. Um, it's basically as soon as we get it. So they have a real time shot of what's going on in the storm. So by the time we land, they're issuing a new forecast 
uh, you know, it's always funny. Everybody, you know, we do these like post flight interviews and like, what was the storm like? I'm like, you guys probably know more about it than I do. Like I was just driving, uh, you know, all that information is streaming off real time. We've got sensors on board too. Uh, one of them is called, we call it the Smurf, uh, step frequency microwave radiometer. It's a sensor that sits under the left wing and it can measure wind speed at the surface by watching sea spray essentially. Um, really? You know, that's fascinating. Yeah. I had no yeah. idea. That. And do you have to have a visual for that? Uh, nope. It can see through clouds. It can go. It's it's a pretty accurate piece of equipment too. Um, that the Hurricane Center and the researchers really count on. That's a, one of our most important ones. Um, the Doppler radar, like I mentioned, is a really big one. Um, you can get wind speeds from the Doppler radar. You can basically see updrafts and downdrafts um, with the Doppler radar, which is pretty neat. Um, we'll drop bigger sensors. We call them BTs. They're basically these big tubes. Uh, that we can launch with a little explosive charge at the bottom of the airplane that hit the surface of the water and then they'll leave an antenna at the surface and it will sink up to you know three four five hundred meters and give the scientist a um, profile of the ocean so so much of a storm's intensity is derived from ocean heat and so a lot of times we'll go in front of a storm drop a bunch of these bts the scientists will see like how warm it is and how deep the warmth is and it's actually really interesting to see uh, drop in BTs on the backside of a storm. And you can see that the storm just sucked all this heat right out of the ocean. Um, so all sorts of different stuff coming off the airplane. You know, this last year, we actually en ended up launching a uh, uncrewed uh, aerial system out of the P3, or the tube launched uh, UAS, into the eye of Ian, actually. And uh, it was kind of like a drop sign, you know, drop sign falls but a UAS can fly around for a while. And so it flew around the eye for a while, providing really, really critical information for the Hurricane Center. So uh, a lot of neat stuff going on in the plane, a lot of interesting science happening in the back for sure. That's so fascinating and intriguing. I mean, basically just listening to all the science that happens here with both the flying and the aircraft and the sensors and what you're doing to kind of predict storms with all those different systems, it it makes me want to go into meteorology right now. <laughs> I want to, I want to come and fly in Orion with you. That's it's that's fun. how yeah. amazing that is. Now, hurricanes, uh, we think about pressure lows and 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 rotation. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's very different than when we're thinking about convective activity. Uh, is that something that you also spend time exploring? Absolutely. So. Uh, Specifically, like inside of a hurricane, and uh, sometimes in the more well-developed hurricanes, we can get, uh, we call them little mesocycles, basically tornadoes that spool up inside the eye with a ton of convection and rising air. Um, the good news is we have a flight director, an in-flight meteorologist, and he or she will basically see that in real time. They'll see it on the radar and be like, yep, I see a little horse over there. Come left five degrees. We're going to pass it down the right side. Like, we will avoid those like the plague. Uh, we had a crew, this is a... I think it was in the early 2000s and Hurricane Hugo uh, basically flew accidentally flew into a, uh, a mini tornado that was in the eye of the storm and it um, almost put the plane on its back it flamed out a motor created sorry I'm talking about fire again but one of the engines caught fire uh, and uh, it was it was pretty bad you know overstressed the aircraft it was like kind of a big deal they ended up flying out of the storm with uh, only three engines uh, so we avoid those, definitely, um, and we've got a lot of great tools on board to keep us away from those. Now, in the off-season, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, what else, what other types of conditions do you avoid? You avoid those types of things. Is the aircraft, I know all aircraft are built to withstand lightning to some degree, but is the, is the Orion in particular, given your mission, um, more protected against uh, uh, things like light lightning, or, or do you experience hail or anything else like that? Yeah, so uh, like lightning strikes are relatively common for us, and we typically don't even know that they happen. So the airplane is spe you know specially designed to be able to withstand those. Um, you know, the scientific power system inside the aircraft does all sorts of kind of uh, grounding outs and things that protect the airplane from lightning strikes. Every now and then we get a bad one. You see a little burn mark on the top of the plane, but uh, you know we've got a, an in-house sheet metal shop that can <laughs> patch up patch up our airplane and have it flying in just a few hours. Uh, it's, it's a sturdy plan. It can handle it really well. Um, but you bring up a really good point with the hail. Uh, you know, our typical mission altitude is between eight and 12,000 feet. Anything above 12,000 feet, we start to get into the, the region where hail or what we call a grapple 
uh, can be pretty bad. So it's basically a mix of hail and rain, and it's basically like flying the plane through sandpaper. I mean, you'll just absolutely disintegrate the props, the leading edges of the wings. Um, you could damage the windshields. It's really, really bad. We try to avoid that as much as possible. So um, on some of the, the, the um, rapidly intensifying storms where there's tons of convection and air rising and air sinking, um, we typically like to fly at slightly lower altitudes to avoid the potential for grapple because we have damaged the airplane pretty significantly um, accidentally running into that. And how do you spell that? Because well, that's a term I haven't heard before. Grapple. G R A U P. Yeah, G R A U P E L, I believe. Wow, there's a term in, in aviation I, I personally haven't heard before, but grapple. Yeah. And and so that's an interesting thing. In in when you're dealing with convective activity, it's lower altitudes for you that are a little bit safer um, mm -hmm. uh, for when it comes to things like hail. Is that something that translates? I know you're also a GA pilot. Does that, is that something that translates to, uh, if you are stuck somehow um, uh, near near a storm as well to GA about lower versus higher when it comes to hail? Yeah, I think it's pretty dependent on your aircraft and the capabilities of the aircraft. You know, I uh, I fly single engine piston around without a nose uh, weather radar, and this job has given me a a, a severe respect for severe weather. Uh, and you know, when I fly with my family, I stay very far away from any sort of convection. I've seen what it can do uh, to aircraft. So, uh, but yeah, you know, like bottom third is kind of always been the kind of the best uh, region. But you know, my advice to anybody is you see convection and you stay away. It's uh, you know, everybody thinks like, oh, you're crazy flying through hurricanes, and um, you know, it's usually a pretty stable environment. Um, we avoid like some of our most challenging flying sometimes is to and from the storm, picking through thunderstorms in the, the floor of summer. Uh, and those storms can be really, really severe. And, you know, we, in the off season, we do a number of other science projects. And one of them, um, it's kind of gives me goosebumps, like thinking about it. I hate flying this mission, uh, but it's a tornado research mission at night in Kansas. And so the scientists were like noticing that, these huge thunderstorms were developing and spitting out tornadoes in the middle of the night. And, every, and the science community was kind of confused about it because, you know, they typically think, uh, you know, heating from the sun during the day causes these big storms. So they wanted us to study it. And so the science crew basically wanted us between five and 10 miles in front of these basically giant shelf clouds that are spitting out tornadoes at night. Um, you know, it's one of the, it was one of the, the weirdest sensations of like bringing sunglasses to a night flight and a hat because the lightning was like, ping, 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 it was like strobe lights going off and you just kind of put your head against the glare shield and just fly your instruments like this with your sunglasses on because it was so bright. There was so much lightning that, that flying was challenging and, uh, it was definitely one of our like more risky flights that we supported when the missions that we supported. You know, granted, we've done it safely for many, many years, um, and we take it very seriously, but that environment changes so fast, and it's such a dynamic and scary environment to be operating a plane around. Wow. So I, I assume you you don't intentionally go into uh, large yeah. thunderstorms. From absolutely Africa. no. Yeah, absolutely not. Yeah, we stay very far away from them. Are there things that you've learned that, that you can kind of pass along from the GA perspective? I mean, I know what the gen, they, they always say general guidelines, right? Like 20, 20 miles from a storm or something like that, or leeward side versus windward side. Mm -hmm. What are things that you've taken away um, other than kind of the generic stay away from it? What, what kinds of th lessons have you learned from doing all this kind of flying that you might pass along to the GA pilots listening? Uh, tactically that can help them stay away in a safer way, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, with this job, I've gotten very comfortable flying around severe weather. And, um, and the reason I can do it is I have so many resources at my fingertips. We've got in-flight internet. I've got three different radar systems. I have a weather expert sitting right behind me into my ear at all times. I can always ask, like, what do you think about that thing? Like, that looks scary. Should I go around that? And like, yeah, go around that. <laughs> Uh, you know, I have so many resources available to me and that's how I got comfortable doing that and with time and experience. And then I find myself with my family, my little single engine plane, and I realize I don't have a weather radar and I've got, you know, Stratus ADS-B style weather that's, you know, there's, there's delays associated with it. The resolution's not very good. Um, and so I basically like gave, I, I 
it took me some time to translate from the kind of flying that I do for my work to the flying I do for fun. And um, it really allowed me to kind of scope in my safety bubble a little bit when I'm flying the GA aircraft, uh, knowing I don't have all those resources available to me and like knowing I'm not in an airplane that's necessarily equipped for that kind of flying. So I would say if, if I've learned anything, I've learned to have respect for the weather uh, mm -hmm. and mother nature and know that uh, she is, uh, she could be a challenge. Mother nature could be a challenge and uh, very unpredictable and uh, you know, been fortunate to, to steer clear of most of most of the bad weather in the in the GA aircraft and um, you know I, I hope to continue a long career with Noah flying in and around uh, the big stuff knowing full well that I've got a great experienced crew backing me up the whole time that's that's amazing what uh, I mean so, so many kind of lessons learned from from all of that to say the least and like we do have as you mentioned a lot of different types of things there's serious whether there's uh, ADSB based weather that people have um, do you have any recommendations in terms of uh, ways that people should should learn more about staying safe around these things, conditions for hail and all the other things that that, that can be so 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 tough on on aircraft on the uh, while flying? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I'm a little spoiled here with a, a staff full of meteorologists, and they spoil us every year with. Uh, we, we call it like a tropical weather briefing, flying and tropical weather briefing. So we spend a lot of time talking about it here at work. Um, other resources available to us. There's a, uh, it's a really, really old video. It's called, uh, the guy's name is Archie Tremel. And he basically talks about um, weather radar and interpreting weather radar and all the kind of like signatures that you can look for. Scalloped edges. Um, steep gradients, like it talks about all the really interesting things. things if, you, if you do fly an aircraft with an airborne weather radar, uh, we actually watch that video as a community every year. It's like probably from the 70s or 80s. I mean, it's old, but there's tons of great information in there. So I believe it's available on YouTube. I think it was the last time we saw it was on YouTube. Um, so the Archie Tremel weather radar is a great one. Um, you know, the FAA has a lot of free resources. Uh, handbooks is like an aviation weather handbook. Um, and just, you know, if, if you're a GA pilot and you're not, you know, you're a blue weather pilot, you're not flying around, uh, it's really easy to get complacent and mm. uh, find yourself in a situation where, you know, you accidentally are flying closer to some, some bad weather that you weren't intending to fly to. So having that knowledge uh, available to you and just staying up to speed, the FAA safety team offers a lot of great like briefs about uh, aviation weather. Um, and, you know, a big thing in our process here at AOC at the Aircraft Operations Center is like utilize all available resources, right? Um, so having those tools available to you in the cockpit um, using a lot of the technology that is available now, uh, you know, make sure you have all that handy. And yeah. um, ATC is also a great resource as well for that kind of stuff if you find yourself into trouble. You know, one of the last points is, is something that I've learned over the years, um, uh, the hard way to be honest, is it's easy in a way when you're looking at, at you know, updating uh, radar uh, of weather and thunderstorms mm -hmm. to sort of think of it as, as predictable and as static, like, like there's a cell and there's a cell and there's a cell or there's a gap and, mm -hmm. and this stuff's just kind of moving as you watch it move. Um, but I know many years ago I, I got into a situation, unfortunately, where I thought I was just gonna be, oh, I can get around all this and it's clear over here. And just to time of day, temperature, saturation, et cetera, all of a sudden, everything kind of went convective and all these things just got created. And so we don't think, I think a lot of pilots don't actually visualize something as, well, here are these, ma these masses, I see these colored areas, but it doesn't mean that all of a sudden, 15 minutes later, 12 more aren't just going to show up out of, out, you know, out of nowhere in a way, but really yeah. out of the heated moist atmosphere. Oh yeah, and we have kind of a, a, f a famous case in the pilot community here of flying that tornado research mission out of Kansas. And so we took off and we flew east to go survey some a storm that we knew was gonna develop. Uh, and we thought that we were gonna be able to do our science and then kind of find a hole to pick our way through and get back in Kansas. It was gonna be like a two and a half, three hour flight. Well, sure enough, uh, the, this is just absolutely massive line of storms that stretch basically the entire United States. Uh, we've, we were maybe 
100 miles away from Kansas at the time, and we had to fly down to the Gulf of Mexico, south of New Orleans, to get around this thing to get back into Kansas. Like, everybody's like, oh, the hurricane hunters aren't going to fly through the weather. It's like, no, no, no. Like, we understand what that weather is doing, and we're not getting anywhere near it. And we'll go the long way around. And, and uh, we definitely made the right choice with that one because that was a pretty serious slam of storms. And yeah, it, it, can, it can change like that. It's so fast. It's such a dynamic environment. Wow. Well, I can't imagine a better lesson and, and warning to all general aviation pilots out there when it comes to weather as the type of thing that might develop that the hurricane hunters and the Orion, P3 Orion from NOAA turn around and say, I'm not going anywhere near that. Nope. I'm going around it. If you're doing that, we certainly should be doing it in all of our aircraft as well. Exactly. exactly. Well, Kevin, thank you so, so much for taking time out of your evening to join us here on Social Flight Live. It's been absolutely fascinating and educational. And uh, I, I know I learned a ton uh, and hopefully everybody else did as well. So please continue to fly safe. I hope you'll uh, you'll come back here on the show at some point and we can talk about what the, the latest season and what you've been doing lately. Sounds good, sir. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. All right. Take care and have a good evening. You too. Bye-bye. And thank you to all of you for taking time out of your evening to join us here again for another episode of Social Flight Live. We'll be back next Tuesday, May 9th, with Heather Penny. Uh, she's been on the show before as the F-16 pilot who flew unarmed on 9-11 in order to attempt to bring down Flight 93. Uh, to um, uh, save people, which of course, the end of 93 was the passengers on board. That said, she, in a sense, that time of 9-11, has become an expert for the Mitchell Institute in aerospace defense. And she will be here in that role, talking to us about America's aerospace, de aerospace defense strategy. It's fascinating, and she has some very, very important information about what this means to our future and future conflicts around the world, where we are positioned as a, as a country uh, with our military, and what their recommendations are going to be and plans are with the Pentagon for the future for both funding and uh, how aerospace defense is going to be approached moving forward. So please don't miss that show on Tuesday next week on May 9th. On Tuesday, May 16th, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show with a special thing happening uh, at Northampton Airport this weekend, well, we are going to have members of the University of Massachusetts aeronautics team here to talk about their experience uh, flying out at uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, AIAA, Design, Build, Fly Challenge, and uh, what it was like to actually do that and contribute to aviation in that matter and get to meet people from all the different schools from around the world. It's really fantastic, and I, I'm looking forward to having that story here on Social Flight Live. Until next time, I'm Jeff Simon. I wish you all blue skies. <laughs>